go. Right, thanks for uh, that introduction, Ben. And uh, yeah, I've been listening all morning and I feel like I've been cast as the villain in this uh, particular conference because it's like, you guys have a particular way of thinking about the Anthropocene. You kind of like interrogate it and sort of have urgent conversations about it. And people like me, we like to make uh, apps out of it. And this talk is actually a repurposed personality test I'm developing and have been developing for a couple of years. And I'm, we're actually gonna try and do a simplified version of the test here and I hope to turn it into an app someday. So we wanna amplify the Anthropocene. So I don't know what uh, you guys, what picture comes to your minds when you think of the Anthropocene, but something like this is what I have in mind, which is you've got this physical stack that ranges from you know dumpsters all the way to jet planes in the sky, uh, and there's like you know nature intertwined with it, and an overlay of digital information flowing. So that's the Anthropocene for me, and inside that you've got this weird species. Uh, that seems to subsist on coffee and do something with that digital device that we now know as a smartphone. And I kind of want to figure out what the species is. And that's kind of why I'm thinking in terms of like, you know, what are the archetypes that inhabit this landscape we call the Anthropocene? It's kind of simpler to come at the question by asking who lives there. Um, and we've been having this conversation about the future of work for like 20 years now. And I've been part of the conversation for maybe 10 years in various uh, ways uh, as a student and as a, you know, a worker in the tech industry and so forth. And I have to start wondering at what point does this conversation stop and we actually arrive at the future of work and we can say we are done. All right, this is what we were talking about for all those years. And this is not a rhetorical question. I'm not making some subtle point that this conversation goes on and on. I think there's an actual answer. These conversations do end. And the future of work arrives after a period of change when archetypes kind of stabilize. And this has happened once before, like uh, the organization Man, 1956. It took about 75 years after the introduction of like, you know, scaled big manufacturing companies for us to really understand what world we were living in. And the way we expressed our understanding of that world was the organization Man archetype, right? And we kind of have to do the same thing with the world we are entering now. And whenever I try to think about archetypes and um, what they mean and how they inhabit their landscapes, um, I'm reminded of this nursery rhyme. Uh, Tinker, tailor, soldier, sailor, rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. And versions of this uh, rhyme go back to the 15th century. And the interesting thing about this rhyme is, if you look at the first line, it's uh, a set of archetypes that fit into boxes. So they're kind of like, um, uh, organization man archetypes, they fit into boxes, literally. Whereas the second line is people who don't fit into boxes, people who are in some sense subversive. They either have the ability to work themselves out of boxes or they kind of lack the ability to be in boxes in the first place. So those are the two kinds of archetypes you can think about, which are people in boxes versus people who are not in boxes. And um, that uh, rhyme continues to live on. I haven't actually read this book, but I just found this and um, the title struck me, Hacker, Hoaxer, Whistleblower, Spy. These are the archetypes we're thinking about today. And the interesting thing you can notice here is that they're all subversive archetypes. They're not box archetypes. They're people who fit outside of boxes, right? All right, so when you think about how the archetypes of work have evolved from you know, um, the organization man to the hacker world we live in now, James Bond is actually a very interesting figure to look at. Like the original James Bond, Sean Connery, Roger Moore, and Q supporting him, uh, they were true organization men. Like James Bond literally had a license to kill. He literally had a code number 007. His uh, comrade in arms, um, Q, was known only by an organizational designation, Q. So they were true organization men. And when Daniel Craig took over the role, it, seems like they had some anxiety related to the, you know, Bond conspiracy theories, and they tried to reimagine the Bond character as well as the Q character as kind of more hacker-like uh, archetypes for the modern age. And there's a scene in Skyfall where they first meet uh, James Bond and Q, which uh, really struck uh, me as kind of defining the world we live in now. So they're meeting for the first time, and Bond is unimpressed with this young Q, and Q claims, I can do more damage with my laptop in the morning before you, uh, than you can do in an entire year. 
And Bond says, so why do you need me? And she says, well, every now and then a trigger has to be pulled and Bond replies, are not pulled. So the part I've highlighted in red, I think is central to thinking about work in the Anthropocene. The definition of a human being human in the Anthropocene is having a very conscious sense of your own agency in the form of things that look like trigger pulling, things that cause history to go off in unpredictable, irreversible new directions. So pulling a trigger is a very consequential act of actually altering history. And Bond is kind of conscious of that, so it's kind of like a very good reimagining of the character. And if you want to sort of theorize what I'm talking about here, this idea of like trigger pulling as the defining trait of humans, this is my gloss on Hannah Arendt's like magnum opus, uh, The Human Condition, wonderful book, uh, which I recommend everybody read. Uh, but basically to be human in the Anthropocene means you are involved in work that's about deciding whether or not to pull triggers, triggers that start in irreversible processes. All else is for robots. Now, this does not mean that there are not humans who don't do robotic work, and this does not mean that robots cannot pull triggers, but sort of the sine qua non of um, uh, humans is the act of pulling triggers and steering history onto you know, unknown new paths. That's what humans are. So my argument is the Anthropocene is when survival in the built environment becomes as hard as survival in the wild, it leads to a near continuous state of creative destruction and a rewilding of humans as a result. And the hacker is the earliest of a kind of like set of archetypes I call cyber paleo species who are defined by the fact that they're trigger pullers in some sense. So that's sort of the, this argument I've been working on for two years, but I've given you the 30 second version of it. So here we get to the personality test, which is what kind of trigger puller are you? So, Take a minute to answer these two questions and you should end up with an answer like B1. Question one, in a bad situation, are you more likely to leave than complain about it? Or are you more likely to stay and complain? Question number one. So question number two, when you're stuck, do you get unstuck by thinking about a system's rules? It's your own ultimate goals within the system or your values, like what's the right thing to do? So I'll give you like 20 seconds of my time here to think about your answer here, so please do actually pick a pair here. Okay, that's enough time for you. Uh, I need to save time for myself. Here are your results. Make a note of them. These are all trigger pulling archetypes. Let's do a quick show of hands. Who picked one of the A archetypes? Raise your hand if, one of, if your answer is in A. All right, down. Raise your hand if your answer is in the B triad. Okay, so there's more Bs than As, my people. <laughs> no, I'm actually more on the A side, actually. I, uh, when I take the full version of this personality test, which is about 28 questions, and I have to run it on 100 people, I score a contrarian. Okay, so just to give you, uh, unpack the theory behind this, the first three archetypes, which are the A answers, the hacker, the contrarian, and the legalist, form what I call the exit triad, and this need not be three different people who are in a team, this can be one person evolving through stages of a project, you can be a hacker in phase one, a contrarian in phase two, and a legalist in phase two. Three. But let me give you your personality test results. If you scored a hacker, so this is an A1, you're an exit-oriented person who's defined by subversion of rules. And the story of the hacker is a reluctant hero who starts a rebe rebellion because nobody else can. If you scored a contrarian, you're an exit-oriented person who's defined by goals. And the story of the contrarian is that of the philosophical embrace of, subversive, of the subversive due to disillusionment with the old, and you kind of become the intellectual who legitimates what the hacker did. And the third archetype in the exit triad is the legalist who comes after the contrarian has uh, you know, a sex scandal and is thrown out of the rebel organization and decides to come up with a set of rules to codify what the hacked rebellion is about. So that's the exit triad. So the story of the legalist is that of the leaderless Ronin who creates a code for the rebellion bringing order to chaos. By the way, these uh, are like tarot cards. We are trying to invent a game on this, a game using these on the blockchain. A friend of mine is trying to work on that. Okay, so the other triad, the B people. Investigator, holy warrior, operator. So those of you who have been paying attention, 
the basic dichotomy here is exit versus voice. Investigator, you are a voice-oriented person. You're also defined by relation to rules, but not subversion, but submission. And the story of the investigator is the morally challenging series of detective stories that leads to greater wisdom. So the investigator, think of the sort of good version of the investigator as like the ethical whistleblower who's kind of in the front ranks and figures it out. And the holy warrior comes next. It's like once a whistleblower has shown you the corruption in the system, well, somebody needs to clean it up. That's the holy warrior, a voice-oriented person who's defined by values. And the story of the holy warrior is the story of a messiah, often ending in martyrdom. How many messiahs here in the audience? One, two, a few. All right. Your result may not be super accurate. If you take the full inventory, it may turn out you might not die. All right. And the last archetype in the voice triad is the operator. This is like, you know, uh, uh, shows like, um, well, why am I blanking on the name? Uh, Ray Donovan. Those of you who watched that show, Ray Donovan is a classic operator. Uh, Michael, Michael something, the George Clooney movie, another classic operator. But basically a voice-oriented person defined by goals who picks up where the holy warrior leaves off. So the holy warrior redefines doctrine and sort of cleanses the philosophical foundations of a corrupt system. But then somebody has to kind of renew the system itself and that's usually an operator. And the story of the operator is that of surviving a collapse and returning stronger than before. All right, so let's put these two together and form like an archetype-based theory of continuous creative destruction that's kind of defining human life as a, you know, a drama of trigger pullings of various sorts while robots do all the real laboring and sort of continuous work. So that's the overarching theory. So you've got a dialectic between exit processes and voice processes. And um, there's a lot more complexity under here. People can sort of shift archetypes as they sort of change and grow. They can even shift triangles. That's kind of like a change of religion. Um, usually when a hacker becomes an investigator or a legalist becomes a holy warrior, that's like a profoundly traumatic experience for somebody to go through. Uh, and I've actually met several people who've gone through that kind of transition. And there's a lot more. I mean, I've been working on this for a couple of years, but just to give you a hint of the kinds of stuff I have in here, the archetypes have various relationships to each other, and uh, they need uh, relationships. Like, you know, the hacker likes to just work with their hands and just get something working, and they might hate the contrarian, but the contrarian is the one who builds the philosophy that justifies the hack, right? So it's kind of like an evil triplet uh, relationship there. The hacker and the investigator are frenemies. They kind of have very similar orientations. They're sort of deontological ethics driven. They're defined by the relationship to rules and habits. But one is a subverter of rules, the other is a submitter to rules, right? So they're frenemies. All right, so there's a lot sort of going on under there. But I, I want to sort of close with this uh, view of the um, same story. In terms of three verb phrases, describing two parts of the dialectic that drive uh, the world today. So disruption is the one um, uh, that we talk about a lot today. It's basically the story is hack the system, justify the hack, systematize the hack. And then the pirates become the Navy, and if they don't realize they've become the Navy, then they think they're in the red triangle, but they're really in the green triangle. Uh, and the story of reform, there's always a counter-reformation, right? I mean, it goes back to the Catholic Church and uh, the Protestant Revolution, right? So the counter-reformation is First, defend the system, but in a moral sense where you're aware of its flaws, then cleanse the system and then renew the system. So that's kind of the dialectic that used to be a part of the world way back, but now everything else is machines and this is the only thing humans are left with to do. So that's sort of a, me trying to transform a personality test into a talk and it's kind of the wrong form factor for it, but uh, hopefully you got a sense of where I'm going with this. And, uh, what my intent here has been to try and like create something that's simple but not simplistic as a model that's actually usable of what's going on in the world. I mean, I'm sort of the, I feel like I'm the enemy here. Like I said, I, I represent the tech world. I work with a lot of the companies that have been severely criticized all day today. And uh, it's like I come here representing the you know, tendency to turn everything into an app. But uh, I think there's like, um, so long as there's an assumption of good faith across you know, the 
art world and the engineering and tech world, there's kind of productive things uh, to, that we can get out of the conversation. And uh, I do want to acknowledge Grace Withrow, my um, illustrator who's made all these wonderful tarot card illustrations and they're gonna go into the essays I'm writing around these concepts. And if you wanna know more, that's my website where you can fork off all the other stuff I do. And thanks to all the various clients and my guinea pigs and the people who've taken all the, the personality test and helped me refine it over the last couple of years. So thank you. Thank you.